We're going to continue in our series, Exodus chapter 34, Exodus 34, verses 5 through 9. Um, if you're no stranger to Brown, we have been reading through the Bible together for a couple of years now. So what we're reading through the week, uh, Pastor Orr is blogging about it. Uh, the things he's blogging about, he is teaching uh, during the week. And then on the weekend, we are preaching from the same thing. And so we've been uh, in January, starting our year off, this year of power in the book of Exodus. So we are going to conclude uh, this series on this morning, Exodus 34, uh, verses 5 through 9. And this is what it reads, says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers on children's and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance." That is God's word uh, today, and you may be seated as we think about uh, this point, uh, God's grace and mercy. God's grace and mercy. Anybody know about God's grace and mercy? Okay, we, we can get out of here. I can give you the cliff notes of what this text is all about, but it says, Your grace and mercy brought me through says I'm living this moment because of you how many y'all know about that say I want to praise him and thank you too come on say your grace say your grace and mercy for oh my brought me through your, your grace and mercy that's what our text is talking about on this morning. And I'm looking at some people who can testify to the fact that God's grace and God's mercy has kept you even to this moment. Is there anybody in here who can testify to the, to the grace and mercy of God? There's somebody else who can testify to the, this ideal of grace uh, and mercy. One of my favorite uh, movies, one of my favorite musicals is one called Les Mis. Uh, in Les Mis, we have this character, Jean Valjean. Uh, Jean Valjean is a criminal. Jean Valjean has done uh, some terrible acts in his life. Jean Valjean has been in prison for some time, but yet uh, Jean Valjean gets released from prison. And as he's released from prison, he stumbles into uh, the house of the bishop, the bishop who uh, graciously took him in and started to begin this relationship with this stranger, this person who uh, you could tell he had been in prison for some time. And as he's in the bishop's house, he's eating some uh, good food. He is able to change his wardrobe, and uh, the bishop is trying to get him a second chance at life. Uh, Jean Valjean does something as he uh, sees many artifacts in this house that uh, look like they were worth uh, some money. He takes those artifacts. He steals some of the items from uh, the bishop's house, and then he flees off into the night. As he is running with the bishop's things, the authorities see him, and knowing that he had just had been taken out of prison, they knew that he probably hadn't had enough time to work to, to acquire these items, and so they arrested him and took him back to the bishop's house. Uh, they get to the bishop's house. They knock on the door, the bishop opens the door, and here it is, Jean Valjean in handcuffs. He is there, and he is looking at the bishop, knowing that the bishop uh, essentially has the keys to put him back in prison because he has stolen these items. Uh, the authorities look at the bishop and says, hey, we have found this man running out, and we know that these are some items from your house, and, and if you tell us that he has stole these things, they're essentially going to put him back in prison. Uh, the bishop looks at Jean Valjean. The bishop looks at the authorities, and he uh, does something that 
catches you by surprise when you watch this for the first time. He, he says, no, I gave him those items. I, uh, this guy, he is my friend. We have developed uh, this relationship, and I, I've given him these items, and, and I'm trying to help him to, to get a fresh start in life. And the authorities are looking. They are shocked at the words of the bishop. Jean Valjean himself was shocked at the words of the bishop because he knew that one word could have changed his life in a negative way where he would have went back to prison. And what the bishop shows us is the fact that he was merciful to Jean Valjean, that his mercy keeps Jean Valjean forgetting what he deserves, that was going back to prison, and allows him to gain a new start in his life. Oh, oh my goodness, uh, the, the Bible records a, another story of God's grace and mercy here in our text in Exodus chapter 34. Now, we see God moving gracefully and mercifully as he delivers his people who had been in Egypt for many, many years. Now, we see his grace and mercy as he would answer their prayers, and even after he would answer their prayers they would disobey time and time again but yet God instead of death he uh, gives them mercy instead of death he gives them deliverance instead of punishment uh, they were on their way to paradise why it was the grace of God and so this morning all we have is this one point that we'll look at and that is God is full of mercy and grace don't take him for granted that God is full of mercy and grace. Don't take it for granted. Our first point today is God's grace. God's grace. You can see it there in the text. It says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. God's grace, this is his compassion for his people. His compassion for his people. We see his compassion throughout uh, this book of Exodus, and all of you have been reading along with us, you know the, the plight of these Israelites. They were in Egypt, and the one thing that he did to show his grace to them is that he heard their cry while they were in Egypt. He heard their cry. They were in bondage. They were under harsh oppression. Uh, Pharaoh was working them 28 hours or so a day. He was working them hard. Life was tough, and as God heard their cry. He answered and delivered them out of the land of Egypt, taking them into the promised land. The fact that God, he heard their cry shows his compassion for his people. And not just the compassion that he had on his people, Israel, but I, I believe this same God still has compassion for us because he hears our cries. Those cries that your neighbor who is sitting next to you can't hear at night when you're at sleep wondering what tomorrow is going to hold. God hears our cries when, when life is coming at us fast and we don't know what to do. I believe we serve a God who hears our cries. Is there anybody in the room who can testify that God has heard your cry? Those cries that even you didn't speak verbally, those cries that you kept in your mind, that God heard their cry and so he delivered them out of Egypt. That was a picture of God's grace. We see his grace as he heard their complaints, even as they walk through the wilderness. Y'all know the story. He delivers them. Uh, he, he does the 10 plagues in Egypt, the last one being the Passover, as all the firstborn of, of Egypt would, uh, would die because the, the Passover, uh, uh, the, the, the angel would come across and to slay all of those kids to show uh, God's power to the world. And so after this, he's leading them to this promised land. They're heading to the Red Sea. They cross over the Red Sea, and now they are moving to this place that he promised that was flowing with milk and honey. So he just delivered them out of bondage. He just delivered them out of oppression. And now he is moving them to this place of paradise. But, but I guess that wasn't enough for, for these Israelites. It wasn't enough for Moses and them because as they started this journey, after they would have seen miracle after miracle performed in Egypt, as, as they are walking, he is providing all of their needs. We see that the people start complaining. I, I don't know about you, but I know y'all know some people who complain all the time. Can you... Can you imagine God has done some incredible things for them, and now they are complaining, saying, Lord, he has brought us out into this wilderness just to kill us. He's brought us out here just for us to die. We don't have any food out here to eat, and, and God had been providing for them. And they would go so much to say that, look, it was better to be back in Egypt, back in bondage, for at least we could get a McRib sandwich every now 
and then. That every now and then I can get my favorite uh, pork shoulder and these hamburgers. They said, Lord, he's brought us out here to, for us to perish. And he b b pulls manna down from heaven to show them that he would supply their need. And every day he was supplying their need. And as he was supplying their need, they would continue to walk. And they would still complain because they said the bread that he was supplying didn't have enough butter on it. They complained and complained, but yet God was gracious and he delivered. He gave them all the things that they needed and more. And they complained even as they was going through the city. They were thirsty and they needed water. And so God supplies water out of a rock to show them, look, that I am the one who will supply your need no matter what is going on, no matter how it looks around, that God will supply your needs. And look, I came here this morning to tell you, for somebody who is out here watching on the scene or on the screen, that God will supply your needs. If you continue to trust in him, if you continue to hold fast to his word, that God will supply your needs. Don't, you don't have to complain. God knows the things that you need even before you ask. We see him. See him supplying their need even as they would complain. And that's good news for us, that he hears and he has compassion. That's good news for us that even when we complain after he has shown us over and over again that he keeps on blessing us. That's good news that he hears our cry, that he answers our prayers. As the saint says of old, he'll hear our cry and answer by and by. That we have a God who is full of grace and mercy, his compassion for his people. And some of you who are sitting here, you might not realize the grace of God on your life. Let me give you some examples of God's grace on your life. There are many ways he shows his grace to us, but uh, for y'all who woke up this morning, that's God's grace on your life. Who started you on your way? That's God's grace on your life. If you had something to put on your table to eat this morning, that is God's grace on your life. However you got to church, whether you had to ride the bus or you drove yourself into the house of worship this morning, that is God's grace in your life. If you have a few dollars in your pocket, even though the weekend is coming to an end, that is God's grace on your life. If that's not enough for you, the psalmist would say in Psalm 103, after he would say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me, uh, bless his holy name, he, he would remind himself to bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. He says he heals all my diseases, that he redeems my life from the pit, that he satisfies me with good, and he crowns me with steadfast love this morning. I'm glad of the power of God's grace to provide for you. Not only does we see God's grace in the text, but we see his mercy. Go back to it, and it says that the Lord, the Lord of God of mercy and grace. Bring us to our second point. We see God's mercy. God's mercy is his goodness towards his people. God's grace, we see the compassion of God on his people, but now we see uh, his goodness towards his people. Now, this, this whole ideal of mercy and the mercy of God is something that all of us would probably scratch our head because we can't really understand in full the mercy of God. Uh, we, we can understand the grace and how he is compassionate for us because we have the ability to, to be compassionate with other people, but this whole ideal of God's mercy is something that even scholars can't understand because that means that he keeps loving and keeps providing for people who won't love him back in return. Uh, he, he keeps loving and keeps providing for people who are always turning their back on him. Uh, the mercy of God says that even when we turn our back on God, that he continues to bless over and over and over again. That's the God of mercy to give us what we don't deserve. Uh, in our text, we see the mercy of God on full display. We, we see his kindness to forgive uh, when they worship idols. You, you know the story, Moses would go up to have this conversation with the Lord 40 days, 40 nights uh, up on, on the mountain and he would get the law of God. And as he was up there, I, I believe that the people got nervous because after 40 days they said, you know what, Moses may not be coming back. I don't know where Moses is at. Moses didn't send out a tweet 
to say he was hanging out with God. Moses couldn't uh, put nothing on Facebook to show, uh, hey, did they up there, you know, having a good time and he is learning from God. He couldn't uh, send out a text message to say, hey, everything is all right. And so I believe the people got nervous and said, you know what? The Lord had taken Moses away. And so now we need to build a, up a, an idol. We need to build up this calf and so we can begin to worship. And you see it in the text, he, they, they get the priests and Aaron, they, they make them, they force them to, to build this golden calf. And as they would have this golden calf, they started worshiping and celebrating uh, to this golden calf that they had just erected while they were waiting on Moses to come down from the mountain. And I can't imagine what it was like. Moses is here hearing from God, getting the law, and, and it is like God looked over his shoulder and saw the people uh, dancing around, around this golden calf. They, they were having this big party, having this big family reunion. They were doing the oar shuffle around this, the golden calf. And, and, and God looked at Moses and said, you know what, Moses, get out of my sight. Look at your people down there. They are worshiping another God. They are worshiping an idol. After I had told them time and time again not to worship any other gods other than me, and here they are, less than 40 days you've been gone. And so Moses goes down, as the story is told. He breaks the tablets, and, and he's trying to figure out what is going on. The music was loud. They were dancing and having a good time worshiping this other god, and God was merciful toward the people. He could have wiped them out. He could have ended it right there and started anew, but he remembered the mercy and the compassion he had on Abraham and the, the promise that I would make your children as numerous as the sand of the sea. And he could not wipe them out. So we see the mercy of God, even when they were worshiping other gods. And I, I believe that it was happening there in our text, but I believe for you and I, if we're honest, we have idols in our lives. Uh, it may not be a golden calf, but we have some idols that are in our lives that we somehow, some way, even after God has blessed us continuously, we like to put other things in front of the worship that deserves only to go to God. Uh, sometimes it could be your career. And even though your career is a good thing, a way for you to provide, a way for you to make change in this nation, sometimes your career uh, pursuits uh, go above your worship for God. If it may not be your career, but it might be your family. Some of you, you, you love your family. We are supposed to love our family and provide for our families. But sometimes our family get in, our, in the way and we begin to worship family more than we worship the one true and living God. All of us, if we are honest, we got an idol that is in our lives that causes us to not see God for who he is as the creator of all things. And look, even though we make these idols daily, God is saying in his mercy that he's willing to cover you, that he's willing to cover you even when you are in sin and you are shaping it in iniquity. He is ready to cover you even at this moment. He, he covered them, showed his kindness to forgive even as they worship idols. But not only when they worship the idols, he was showing his kindness to forgive as they complained against him. We talked about those complaints earlier. As God is supplying, it was like it was not enough. That even though he gave them their food, even though he gave them something to drink, it was not enough. And essentially, as they kept complaining against God, they were saying, you know what, God, you are not enough. That in their, in their complaints, as he is supplying all of their basic needs, uh, they, they essentially would spit in the face of God and say, you know what, God, you are not enough. Now, that's a hard statement to grasp, but as you look at how he is providing and giving them everything that they need, giving them everything that they want, it seems like it is not enough, and it's not enough as he continues to bless them over and over and over again. It is not enough, and they said, God, you are not enough. And sadly, there are many people who claim the name of Jesus Christ who are saying those same things every day that, God, you are not enough. God, you have protected us in this pandemic and you had allowed me to keep living. But you know what, God, that's, that's not enough. You've supplied all of my needs and given me a job where I can take care of all of the bills. But you know, God, you are not enough. Many times we are struggling in this life and telling God that he is not enough after he has blessed us over and over and over again. But God is merciful. He keeps supplying all of our needs, even the things that we don't deserve, when we deserve punishment, when we would deserve uh, death, that God loves us even more. When I thought about that. I remember my son, after he had taken a couple of swimming lessons and thought he was a deep sea diver, he 
every time he saw a pool, any time we were anywhere, he wanted to get it into the pool. And, and so the same thing happened on this glorious day, uh, 1 June, I think of 2019. We are at this party that uh, my wife had signed my son up to go to. One of his classmates had a party uh, that morning, and then we had another party that afternoon. I think she had about three birthday parties on this day. And you all know I, I don't like kids' birthday parties. I, you know, I, I struggle with kids' birthday parties. But here we are. We, we're at this birthday party, and it was at a place with, with tennis clubs and, and tennis rackets, tennis courts, and had basketball courts, and they had this big pool. And this is where most of the kids spent their time in the pool. And so likewise, my son had his trunks. He's out there swimming. He's having a good time. I'm in my regular clothes because, you know, we got a, another party to go to after the fact. And so here they're, they're swimming. They're having a good time. They eat. They cut the cake. They sing happy birthday. They jump in the water some more. And now it's time for us to go. And I said, Daniel, look, it is time to go. I got to get you dried up. We got two more parties to go to on today. And so he comes out and I'm going to get his bag and get the towels to make our way to the dressing room so that we can get dried up and get ready for the next party. And I, I turn around and Daniel had heard the boys going back into the water again. Uh, these boys would jump back into the water. And so my son, likewise, because that's what they had been doing the whole time, he, he jumps back in the water after I told him, hey, no, we, we're about to get ready to go. We got another party to go to. And so he jumps out into the water. But this time as he jumped out into the water in his uh, early ages and early stages of swimming, they had gotten to a place where he, his foot couldn't touch the bottom of the pool. And he was in there, and he, he got nervous. He started to panic, and he uh, forgot all of the swimming techniques and the paddling. And though, so there he is. He's jumped out into the water, and he's going out a little bit. But I noticed he, he wasn't moving. He, he wasn't doing the things. And I'm looking at the lifeguards, and I'm like, is anybody seeing what I'm seeing? And it happened so fast. And so, so here I am. I, I jump in the water, all my clothes on and all iPhone in my pocket, keys, my wallet, everything in my pocket. I jump in the water to come and get my son because of the mercy and the compassion that I had for my son. But a part of the mercy goes that I, I should have slapped him across the face and said, son, why did you jump into that water? I should have gave him a verbal tongue lashing because he had disobeyed what I said. But instead, I said, son, how are you doing? Son, are you okay? Son, are you doing all right? And I believe that's what God does as he shows us his mercy. That when we mess up, when we jump out into that pool of sin, that he picks us up, he grabs us out of that and says, Son, daughter, how are you doing? He doesn't whoop us around. He doesn't beat us down. But he says, I love you. I have compassion. How are you doing? That's the mercy of God. And I'm so glad this morning for the power of God's mercy that will cover us even in the midst of our sin. Is that somebody who can testify how God had pulled them out of the muck and mired clay? When you were walking in sin, when you were walking in darkness, that God was so rich in mercy that he pulled you out and he brushed you off and he placed your feet on the solid rock that is Christ. God will show mercy to us. So we see God's grace. We, we see God's mercy. But the last thing in our text, and we're going home as we see his love for his people. Go back to the verse. It says, A God merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And this gives us our last point this morning of God's love. It's his patience towards his people. We, see God, we saw God's grace, which was his compassion. We see God's mercy, his goodness, but now we see uh, God's love and it's his, his patience for people. God's love for people made him respond in a way uh, that was different. It, it made him respond in a way that was not typical of the ways he would have responded in the past. Uh, we, we all know that the Bible says that the wages of sin is what? Is death. And the gift of God is everlasting life. But, but for somehow, some reason, here in our text, we see God do something that uh, is unusual in his uh, mainframe at this particular moment. But he, he shows them grace. He shows them love. He is long-suffering in how he is dealing with his people. It's something about love that it makes you do some, some funny things. We're about to go into February, and many of us are about to celebrate the love or the loves of our lives. And some of us are going to do some, some things that love make us do some crazy things. Buying up all of the flowers and chocolates and all those things. We, love makes you do something 
crazy. And I, I believe God here is showing us how, how his love for his people is, is causing him to do some crazy things because they deserve death, but yet he, he graces them, uh, gr lavishes them with his grace and his mercy. He, he loves on them in a way that shows them that no matter what you do, that he is going to be with them in their life. He shows us his love. That when he should have punished them, that he was slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that he was slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You know the story, every time they would get delivered, that they would begin to sin again. God would deliver, they would worship for a little while, and then they would sin again, and they, God would deliver them again, and they would worship for a little while, they would sin again. It's this sin cycle that we see all throughout the Old Testament, and it was no different for the children of Israel, but every time that they would mess up, Every time they would slip up and do something they were not supposed to do, we, we see God being a God full of love and compassion for his people. When he could have taken them out, when he could have thrown in the towel, he was still gracious and loving them because he had this unfailing, unconditional love that he so richly lavished his people. And I submit today that the same God who was rich in love and mercy on the children of Israel is the same God who is loving us so well even on today. How many of y'all are glad for the unconditional love of God? That when you mess up, that when you fall short, that when you do the things that are not supposed to do, that God still loves us anyway. That God loves us despite all of our flaws and all. That God will love us even in the darkest moments of our life. And if there's anybody out here who may be in a dark moment in your life, don't think that you're far away from God. But God, he loves you right where you are. Because this love that God shows us is not any ordinary love. This is an unconditional love that no matter what you do, that God will continue to love you. It reminds me of the story of Hosea. I know we're not reading the book of Hosea, but Hosea gives us a fascinating story about how Hosea would love his wife, Gomer. That every time she would step out on their marriage, that he would go back and get her. That he, he went back time and time again. Every time she would slip out the house and find her another lover, that he would go and find her in the wee hours of the night because he loved her so much that it didn't matter how many times she slipped out on him, that he still pursued her and still went after her. And let me tell you tonight, that's the same way that God is doing for us, that he is going after us in the same way because of his great love for us. And I don't know why he loves us this way. It doesn't make sense for him to love us this way, but I'm glad this morning that God loves me despite all my flaws and all. That God, he loves me, even when I don't love myself. Is there anybody who is out here this morning who is glad that God loves you? That even when you were walking in sin, that God, he loved you. And he picked you up and he turned you around and he placed your feet on solid ground. Is there anybody out here tonight who knows about God's love that lifted you? out of the muck and mired clay i don't know why he loves me this way but i'm glad that he loves me and i'm glad that i'm his and he is mine how many y'all know that jesus is mine that everywhere i go that everywhere i be that jesus is mine i'm so glad this morning for god's grace and his mercy that's what brought us through that we're living this moment and it's because of you and how I want to thank him and I want to praise him too because it was your grace and mercy that brought us through. Is there anybody in here that can testify about God's grace and his mercy? That God's grace has been holding you. God's grace has been keeping you alive. That when you wanted to do wrong, that it was God's grace that was holding you together. It was God's grace that was keeping you from destruction. That it was God's grace that was holding you in place. That even when you thought you was going to lose your mind, that it was God's grace that was holding you together. They wouldn't let you go. And I need God's grace right now to hold me down. Sometimes I don't want to do right. And I need God's grace 
to hold me together that sometimes I want to do wrong and I need God to, to hold me together is there anybody that want God to hold you in place but not just his grace but his mercy that when I do wrong that he still loves me anyway his mercy he gives me what I don't deserve his mercy that when I fall short that he still loves me that he still cares and I don't know why but he loves me and I'm glad about it are you glad this morning that he still loves you with all your flaws and all God he still loves me and I'm glad this morning that he still loves me how do you know that God loves you I'm so glad you asked because one Friday on an old rugged cross he died shed his blood went down in the grave but early 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 Sunday morning you know the story he got up and he had all power in his hands I'm glad I'm so glad that God has power power to heal power to deliver power to keep me in my right mind power to hold me together power to keep me power to dust me off power I'm glad are you glad this morning for God's power working in our lives this is the year of power and we'll believe in God to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can imagine we need God to do exceedingly in our neighborhoods as crime is running around we need God's power in the school system right now we need God's power in our families right now we need God's power in the church house right now we need God's power around the world I'm glad for God's power are you glad this morning are you glad this morning yeah say yeah oh yeah I'm glad this morning so glad for his love his mercy it's God's grace and mercy that's keeping us the doors of the church are open it's nothing but the grace of God 